I first saw the light of day in London in 1906. I have no recollection of that city as a child. We moved to the country in Kent a year or so later, which I loved. My memories are very vague. A big house, sweeping lawns, a magnificent wisteria smothering a large tree, orchards, glass houses, and a big dog Jack who went everywhere with me. My father was not a very good businessman, though I knew nothing of such things then. We left there and went to another place, also in Kent. It was here that what I regarded as a serious interruption to my education occurred. I was compelled to go to school. One of the more undistinguished periods of my life. I have no doubt the relief I felt when I left was only exceeded by that of my teachers. At the age of 17, I decided to leave England for what was then known as the Colonies. It was not a difficult decision to make. In a family of eight, I was the eldest son. And though I believe I was of an amiable disposition, it was not sufficiently amiable to endear myself to my father, a feeling that was reciprocated. In 1923, when I saw posters beckoning young empire builders, I had no doubt where my destiny lay. The advertisements were for Canada, New Zealand and Australia. Those of Canada and New Zealand depicted scenes of emerald green pastures with a backdrop of breathtaking snow-capped mountains. I had no doubt what winter would be like there. I've always hated the cold. I was still a minor by law, and consequently my parents' permission was required. And while my father had little affection for me, he would undoubtedly have vetoed my projected Australian adventure and he thought it was something I wanted to do. My mother was a very patient and lovely lady, and I now know that when I asked her to help me go to Australia, it was a heart-wrenching decision for her, but she believed it was for the best. We enlisted the help of my Uncle George, who, presumably, forged my father's signature on the relevant documents. I received my sailing instructions and set off for London on a rare and lovely August day. I stayed with my grandmother for a few days before joining an Orient line ship, RMS Ormuz, at Tilbury on the Thames. My elder sister Peggy was the only one who came to farewell me. It's worth recording that, though my absence from the hearth and home must have been obvious, it would seem my father was determined not to notice it. A fortnight later, when presumably he couldn't stand it any longer, at breakfast one morning he asked, Where's Tom? My mother replied, He's gone to Australia. He never mentioned my name again. My first sight of Australia was Fremantle. Then on to Adelaide and Melbourne. A few days later, we sailed through Sydney Heads as the sun was rising. I thought it was the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen. We were there for ten days for repairs to the propeller. When they were completed, the ship continued to Brisbane, my destination. The Department of Immigration had lots of jobs lined up, and I unhesitatingly took one on a cattle property in the Maranoa district because it was the furthest out. There was no competition. I have no clear recollection of my first experience with horses or learning to ride, but looking back, it seems that riding never presented any difficulties, and I liked horses. I trapped rabbits in my spare time. I bought a Winchester rifle and shot kangaroos, making a little money from the skins. Then, with the approval of the manager of the property where I was working, I went to the Northern Territory. The first cattle station I worked on was Lake Nash. The furthest sub-artesian bore from the homestead was a hundred miles, yet still inside the boundary. I quickly adapted to the routine of station life. In this book, I recount not only my own experiences, but also those of other men with whom I worked and respected, the pioneers whose names and exploits were still fresh in men's memories. This would not be complete without a tribute to the many Aborigines with whom I worked and got to know so well. I have been fortunate in that for many years I kept diaries and also that my mother, who died at the age of 101, kept all the letters I wrote from the day I left England. I'm glad to say I was a fairly regular correspondent. I was in the head office of the Queensland National Pastoral Company, a subsidiary of the Queensland National Bank, one of Australia's largest cattle companies, whose dominion encompassed some 30,000 square miles, from the centre of Queensland across to the Northern Territory. Behind a polished oak desk sat a benign gentleman of sandy complexion, peering at me over the top of his rimless spectacles. Another gentleman sprawled in an armchair to his side. I stood before them, burning with empire-building zeal. The gentleman with the spectacles addressed me. Well, Cole, you're the type of man we're always looking for, unfortunately all too rare. I swelled with pride. 
I am confident that not only will you make your mark with this company, but if you identify yourself with your work in the Northern Territory generally. The gentleman in the armchair nodded affably. I assumed I was supposed to say something in the brief silence that followed, but being suddenly overcome with a mixture of the great Australian pioneering spirit and intense verbal inadequacy, all I could do was stutter, uh, thank you. The taller of the two who sat behind the desk nodded to his colleague, who then cleared his throat and handed me an envelope. You'll find there your railway ticket to take the train from Brisbane to Townsville changed to a train for Cloncurry. From Cloncurry you take another train to Duchess and from there you take the mail coach to Lake Nash. There is also £20 for out-of-pocket expenses. We wish you every good fortune. When you arrive at Lake Nash you'll report to the manager, Mr Sutton, he is expecting you. There was a pregnant pause. Your wages will be one pound a week with keep, of course. There was a trumping noise in my ears. One pound? It can't be serious. A few minutes later, I was standing in Queen Street, Brisbane, clutching an envelope that contained 1,500 miles of tickets and 20 pounds. The words, one pound a week, were still ringing in my ears. Three days later, I left the train at Cloncurry. I asked the station master when was the next train to Duchess. The next day, he said, if it gets back. He didn't say from where, I assumed, from Duchess. I stood there for a while, collecting my thoughts, then asked him where the nearest pub was. I arrived at the hotel after walking about a quarter of a mile in the searing heat. Three unsaddled horses were tied up in the shade of a gum, and their saddles lay at the foot of the tree. A subdued hum came from the direction of the bar as I pushed through the door. It took a while to become accustomed to the gloom. Five or six men at the bar turned and looked at me as I came in. One man lay stretched out on a bench, snoring, flies hovering over him in a black cloud. From time to time, the beat of his snoring changed slightly as a few flies disappeared into his mouth. Another held the floor, reciting a classic and anonymous bush poem. One of the men, who appeared to be a stockman, called out to me, Come and join us, stranger. I left my suitcase in the corner, walked over. He held out his hand and said, I'm Steve Johnson, and then named his companions. I introduced myself. I'm Tom Cole, I said, and I'll have a cold beer. Well, you'll be bloody lucky to get that, Steve replied. The barman went to a box-like contraption covered in damp hessian that swung from a wire from the ceiling and took out a bottle of beer. Feeling it, he said, Oh, it's pretty cold. Steve laughed. It probably just off the boil if I know anything. I poured a glass and thought he wasn't far wrong. Before I'd drunk half, flies started to drop into the glass, and as fast as I fished them out, more dropped in. One of the men said, You never get a drink that way, just strain it through your teeth. Another said, You're better off drinking rum, and it's a keen on rum. Well, we drank for a while, and I listened carefully. I was another world. They talked of nothing but cattle, horses, the tremendous cattle runs. Anything less than 5,000 square miles hardly got a mention. Alexandria Station was 10,000 square miles, Brunette Downs was 8,000, Wave Hill 6,000. But the daddy of them all was Victoria River Downs, referred to as the Wickham. Because, as I found out later, the station homestead was on the bank of the Wickham River. Victoria River Downs was 13,000 square miles, slightly larger than Belgium. Now the afternoon drifted by, and then the blessed relief of night, suddenly there were no flies. At some time or other we left the barn, I found I was sharing a room with Steve in a corrugated iron cubicle with two beds. With a bottle of rum between us, we talked into the early hours of the morning, and I will always look back on it as a valuable contribution to my education. I was anxious to learn and eager to listen. He asked me a few questions about my own background. Rather Glen, the first place I worked was 30,000 acres. Later I moved to a nearby property of 150,000 acres, big enough to be called a station. Steve referred to that area as inside. You come from inside, he said, and you'll find things a hell of a lot different where you're going. I've never been on Lake Nash, but there's not much difference between any of these places. If you've got a good boss... That's the best you can expect. You better dump that suitcase, get yourself a swag cover, it's all you want. We can't carry a suitcase on a pack horse.
I'll go up the street tomorrow and get you a few yards of canvas. You'll want a quart pot and a saddlebag. Get a quart pot you can fasten to your saddle days. Have you got a pair of hooks? I nodded and pulled my spurs from my suitcase. They're all right, he approved. Have you got a stock whip? I shook my head. My previous jobs had both been in an area of heavy mulga scrub, I explained. Ah, oh, you better get yourself one. About seven feet. Anything any longer is too awkward, and you're sure to be asked if you ride. Tell them, yes, a quiet horse. Anyone who goes to one of these places and says he can ride needs to be in rodeo class or he's a mug. Don't get caught with that one. Next morning, Steve came along while I did my shopping. When I'd finished, I had a canvas swag cover, two swag straps, a quart pot and a saddlebag. But my most prized purchase was a beautifully tapered, plaited kangaroo hide stock whip, which I didn't know how to use. Back at the hotel, I repacked my belongings. Steve showed me the way to roll a swag so it would sit on a pack saddle properly. I sold the suitcase to the barman for five shillings. The train arrived and was in for an hour and a half. The station master grumbled that he'd held it up half an hour for me, which I doubted, since I had left the bar at the same time as the fireman. We wound our slow, laborious way through undulating hills of red ironstone covered with spinifex and stunted gums. Mostly the track was level, but when we came to a hill it seemed we would never make it. Yet, though the train was down to walking pace, somehow it managed. Downhill it probably got up to 30 miles an hour, assisted by a tailwind. Soot and cinders blew into the only carriage which hadn't been swept for a week. That night I was thankful for my swag, which I rolled out on a seat and made as comfortable as possible. It was better than a suitcase. As I woke... The sun was just rising. The train was stationary. I stuck my head out of the window and there's a scattering of houses not far away. I was at the Duchess. I rolled up my swag for the first time, an operation with which I was to become extremely familiar over the next 25 years, and made my way across to what proved to be a hotel where, although it was six o'clock in the morning, the bar was operating. I asked the barman if there was a mail coach utility leaving for Lake Nash. He pointed to one of the two men drinking... Here's the driver, he said. I went over and announced my name and destination. OK, he said. We'll be leaving as soon as I pick up the mail and some stores. From the Spinifex Hills we came to limitless plains, occasionally crossing dry watercourses fringed with cooler bars, sometimes passing waterholes. The cattle watering there were gaunt and miserable. We passed boars with great windmills towering over them, always there were several hundred head of cattle standing around. And always there were a number of dead ones with crows in hundreds feasting on the carcasses. The stench was unbearable. Once in the distance we saw a great cloud of dust which resolved itself into a mob of bullocks driven by five or six men. When we got level with the mob, we pulled up under a small solitary tree and one of the drovers came cantering over. After an exchange of greetings, the mailman went to the back of his utility and pulled out two bags, obviously something he'd obtained for the drover in the Duchess. Occasionally we came to a gate, but they were few and far between. We dropped mail at Carondotta Station and at Urundangi, one of the two westernmost towns in Queensland. We stopped again at Headingley Station, left some mail, had a meal in the kitchen with a boundary rider and a horse breaker. The sun was setting when we took to the road again, and soon it got dark. There was a half moon. I was dozing fitfully when the driver gave me a nudge. Gates, he called. I woke with a start. The utility had stopped in front of two large gates, on each side of which I could see in the faint moonlight a netting fence stretching north and south. The vehicle moved through and pulled up, waiting for me to close the ponderous gate. As I got back into the utility, the driver said laconically, You're now in the Northern Territory. I reached Lake Nash in the middle of the night and in the middle of one of the worst droughts recorded. I was driven out to the stock camp that night by the manager, Frank Sutton, who appeared to be an irascible old bastard, but wasn't really. The vehicle was a modern T-model Ford. The stock camp was 50 miles out, and we had two gates to go through. The engine faithfully stopped at each gate, and it took 15 minutes or so to get it started each time. The camp was active when we arrived. There were six white men, including the cook, and four aborigines. 
There were 60 or so horses rounded up. Some stockmen were busy catching horses and saddling them, while others were leading horses up to the pack saddles, throwing the packs on their backs and hooking the large pack bags to the hooks on the pack trees. Tommy Dodd, the head stockman, came over as the car pulled up. G'day, Tommy, Frank said. I've got a ringer for you. Tom Carl from Queensland. Are we losing many cattle? Dodd looked grave. Oh, I'd say overall about a hundred a day and the rate must increase unless it rains. Trouble is the surface water dries up and I've got nowhere much to move them. Sure, I can put them on bores, but every bore's overstocked now. Well, Tommy, there's nothing to do except wait for rain. When you've got Arga Darga to cleaned up, you'll have to paddock your horses. How are they? Dodd pointed to them. They were gaunt, listless and miserable. Some had saddle sores. Everything was depressing. In the distance, a dust cloud hung over a stockyard full of bellowing cattle. Sutton walked over to the car. So long, Tommy. Nothing I can do staying here. All the best. He called to me. Wind her up, Tom. And said to Tommy, He's the best self-starter I've ever had. I gave the handle one crank, and to my astonishment it started. I was still pondering the value of his accolade as he drove away. With a certain amount of trepidation, I turned to the head stockman. Suddenly I felt very lonely. I'd always wanted to get to the Northern Territory, and here I was. This country of vast distances with cattle stations of almost unbelievable dimensions became very real. Tommy named the stockman to me as they were saddling their horses. Fred Stevens from the Curry. Jim Groom, a magnificent horseman who came to Lake Nash from Dalgonnelly, a station famous for its buck jumpers. Then there was Bob Roberts and Joe Brown and four Aborigines. Tommy pointed to a heavy stock saddle lying at the foot of a gidgy tree with a bridle and a saddle cloth. Oh, that's your gear. Come over here and I'll show you your horses. Can you ride? I remembered Steve Johnson's words of wisdom. Yes, a quiet horse. We walked over to the mob. Oh, that grey there, Rainmaker's his name, the chestnut with hobbles on with two white hind feet. Socks. He's a bit hard to catch. And the chestnut mare with a silver mane and tail. Turtle's her name. I was carrying my bridle and slipped it on Rainmaker and saddled him. The camp was pretty well packed up. The horse tailors and the cook were putting the packs on the last two horses. Six had already been packed up, and the bulging pack bags held the camp rations and gear. Green hide ropes, spare hobbles, horseshoes and shoeing gear. Our swags were strapped on top of the pack saddles. Two men rode on each side of the milling mob of cattle, which gradually began to take some sort of form, two men on each wing keeping the sides straight. The stronger cattle took the lead, but the main bulk of the herd, cars with their calves, straggled along behind. The head stockman was up with the leaders, which by now had strung out and were more than a quarter of a mile from the tail. A stockman learns early. The speed of a mob is the speed of the slowest beast. You don't drive the tail to catch the lead. Tommy Dodd called to Stevens, Fred, get up there and steady the lead. The sun got higher, the heat increased. The leaders were steadied, and instead of the cattle being a long, narrow mob, they were spread widely across the plain, feeding fitfully on Mitchell grass stubble. We came to a patch of scattered gidgy timber, the spidery limbs and narrow leaves providing a sparse shade. This was our dinner camp. The cattle, needing little guidance, moved in gratefully to rest in the shade. A pack horse that had been ambling along with the cattle was led up to a fire. Quart pots were filled from water canteens, and soon... We were squatting on our haunches, swallowing scalding black tea and tearing off hunks of corn, meat and damper. Two stock horses were kept saddled. The rest were unsaddled and hobbled out. I went over to the best shade I could find, turned my saddle upside down for a pillow and passed out. And it seemed as though I'd only been asleep for seconds when a stock whip cracked in my ear. Tommy Dodd was sitting on his horse grinning down at me. Sorry to have to wake you, but we're moving off. The sun had moved around while I was asleep. I was no longer in the shade and in a lather of sweat. Somebody had bridled Rainmaker and tied him to a tree and I saddled him. The cattle were starting to move and as we left the timber and topped a ridge, I could see a windmill about five miles away. I guessed it would take us about four hours to get there. At five o'clock, Dodd called to me. Tom, come up to the lead with me and give us a hand with the watering. Telling the men at the tail, don't push them. 
It'll take at least two hours to get them all watered. I don't want too many hitting the trough at once. We came up with the leading beasts about two miles from the tail. The windmill wasn't far away. Now, contrary to what a lot of people think, cattle cannot smell water unless it's in contact with the ground. They can't smell water in a trough. Tommy called to Fred Stevens on the opposite wing. Fred, canter up to the trough, throw a few quarts on the ground so they can smell it. I trotted up to the lead and kept them steady until we were up to the trough. Then there was no stopping them. They were thirsty and buried their noses in the water. Soon their bellies were at bursting point and I worked them away from the trough for another mob to trot in. They came in mob after mob. It got dark and still they came. The mob out in the plain grew larger and was being held by three men. Eventually, we were finished. Each man took his swag, picked a place to sleep and unrolled it. After a hasty wash, we gathered round the fire. The head stockman came in and cut the night into watches of an hour and a half. I was put on first watch with a horse tailor. We squatted down the hunkers to gulp a plateful of corned beef curry and after a pannikin of black tea, settled a night horse. We took over at nine o'clock and rode continuously all through our watch. The night horses knew their work, needing little guidance. Apart from the brief sleep on the dinner camp, I'd been up for about 38 hours. When I got into my swag, the hard ground could have been a feather bed. The long, weary days of moving cattle from the failing water holes to bores went on and on. The sun blazed relentlessly from a completely cloudless sky day after day. Looking into that sky, it seemed as though it would never rain again. Eventually, the cattle moving came to an end. There was nowhere else to put them. All the bores were overstocked, and from then on, it was a matter of how many would survive. The plains were bare for a radius of ten mile, and only the strongest cattle could reach the feed. As they became weaker, they died. It was pitiful to see, and the smell of death was everywhere. Some of the stockmen were put on bores to pump water. One day Frank Sutton picked me up from the stock camp. You're going to number 17 bore to help old Denny Downs out, he told me. He's got 3,000 head of cattle to water and he's complained he's got to pump 20 hours a day. The old bastard's getting soft. Number 17 bore was on the edge of a plain close to the western boundary, 98 miles from the station homestead. For a month, I saw no one except Dinny. We worked 10-hour shifts, cutting up the tough gidgee to feed the boiler furnace, which kept the steam engine going to drive the pump. There was nothing soft about Dinny Downs. He swung that four-pound axe in the blazing sun day after day like a machine. I tried to keep up with him, but couldn't. I cut enough firewood for my shift, but only just. One day, he got toothache. He didn't say much, but I saw him rummage about in our toolbox and take out a pair of fencing pliers. I looked at him in silent astonishment as he made himself comfortable on the ground with his back to a tree and pulled his own tooth out. Jesus, I thought, that old bastard's tough. He spat a mouthful of blood out, shook his head a couple of times and looked at me with a grin. Christ, he said, that hurt. I'm glad there was only one. I found that life on a big cattle station was unquestionably tough. Wages ranged from five shillings a week for the black stockman to a pound, me, three pounds for an experienced stockman, three pounds ten for a cook, more than those bastards were worth but never mentioned in their hearing because they were inclined to be a bit sensitive, and the head stockman, four pounds. We got what was loosely referred to as full keep. Board and lodgings, I suppose. The board part was mainly corned beef and damper, a tin of treacle a week known through the West as Kidman's blood mixture for its presumed health-giving qualities. A bottle of tomato sauce and a bottle of Worcestershire sauce, which, we were reminded, was made from a recipe of a nobleman of the country. The lodging was Mother Earth plus a shady tree. Some stations did a bit better, Rocklands was well thought of because they used to throw in a few tins of apricots and peaches, a tin of custard powder and a tin of butter. Usually half rancid, but all right for cooking. There was never any shortage of beef. A fat cow was killed about once a week. Then we were able to gorge ourselves with fresh meat, but only for a day or perhaps a couple of days in the cold weather. Wouldn't keep any longer. The rest was salted down, and if we were in camp, 
stacked on a table made of saplings and a fire lit beneath it to keep the blowflies away. After a couple of days, shit beetles appeared. Normally they lived in the cattle dung, but they found corn meat a much more desirable area for their activities. On the big western Queensland and northern territory stations such as Lake Nash, we'd get our rations every six months. Two tons of flour would arrive at a time to be stacked in corrugated iron sheds. Before long, the weevils would invade it and breed with incredible rapidity. Though this was never a matter of concern until they left the flour. A 50-pound bag of flour that has gone through the bowels of 50 million weevils has no food value whatsoever. Epsom salts was an important part of the first aid kit. Constipation was almost a way of life. Three or four days was considered a reasonable time lapse, but five and over called for an ounce of Epsom salts. An ounce of salts was equal to about a quarter plug of dynamite. When the stock camps came into the head station every few months for a change of horses, it had been three or four days spent mustering the fresh ones and shoeing them. We were then able to luxuriate on broken spring iron beds in the men's quarters that were an igloo in the winter and a pressure cooker in the summer. When we were out on the run mustering, nature did a much better job. Our swags rolled out under trees beside creeks. Lake Nash was about 6,000 square miles. The herd of shorthorn cattle varied from 20,000 to 25,000, depending on the season. During a drought, the losses would be very heavy, mostly old cows with young calves at foot. As the feed around the water got eaten out, they had to walk further and further for feed until it became too far and their milk dried up. They would stagger into water because of the intense heat and often get hopelessly bogged, the calves standing by, bellowing plaintively. The crows were always there in flocks and had picked the eyes from the bog cattle after that. It was the calves' turn. How you get to hate crows? Overhead, the kite hawks would be wheeling. At least they had the decency to wait for death. The hours were long and arduous, more so in times of drought, 16 hours in the saddle was by no means unusual. The routine started at 4 or 5 in the morning. Out of the swag, a quick wash if there was sufficient water. Swags rolled and laid beside the pack saddles. Breakfast was rough and ready. Sometimes curried corned beef, sometimes stewed corned beef, sometimes corned beef dipped in a batter and fried, called for some reason burdekin duck, but always corned beef except for a couple of days after we killed. That stockmen were lean and wiry was due to their diet. That most were healthy was a miracle. Each man was allotted three saddle horses. Each horse was worked one day and had two days spell. The station supplied the saddles and bridles, mostly heavy and uncomfortable. The older hands usually had their own saddles. Everyone looked after their gear and horses, especially their horses, all of them, with few exceptions were genuine horse lovers. The general run of horses on Lake Nash was good. The thoroughbred stallions used for breeding may have had their day as racehorses, but they had many virile years of stud duty left. Consequently, many of the stock horses were half and three-quarter thoroughbred. Unless they were very well grown and developed, they were not broken in until they were four years old. The horsebreaker was about the best paid man on a station. In addition to the ordinary stockman's wage of three pounds a week, he received 25 shillings a head for every horse he broke. Sometimes a manager would limit his breaker to four a week, maintaining that any more than that could not be given proper attention. But not very often. When a breaker came onto a station to break in, he might ask, what's the limit? Normally, the manager would say, that's up to you. Finally, I got away from the drudgery of wood-cutting, digging post holes and yard-building. The stock camp was swinging into action. The cook had been busy drawing rations from the store, and when we rode out from the station with pack bags bulging, riding fresh horses that were reefing at the bit, their muscles rippling under their satin coats, there was a different feeling. The creeks and water holes purged of the rotten carcasses were sweet and clean. Waving Mitchell and Flinders grass grew to the water's edge. Wildfowl were everywhere on the plains. Stalking turkeys gorged themselves on the swarms of insects. Wild ducks were on every billabong. We made camp at Kelly's Creek, unpacked and hobbled the horses. Now there was an autumn feeling. The nights were starting to get cold. The mornings were crisp and clear. 
The horse tailors had left to muster the horses before the first glimmer of light and were rounding them up in front of the camp. We saddled up and as dawn swept across the plains, rode out behind the head stockman. It was arduous work. Seven days a week and nothing less than twelve hours a day in the saddle, fourteen to sixteen when night watching started. Most of us preferred the bullock musters. It was straightforward work and, of course, the best time of year. Grass and water were plentiful and the horses in good condition. After about ten days mustering, we had some 1,400 bullocks in hand. Another day was taken up cleaning them out, drafting off anything a bit doubtful. The number required for the drover was 1,250 plus killers for his meat supply. This was calculated at a beast a week for the length of time it would take him to reach his destination. Our drovers would go to a lot of trouble to avoid killing one of these. The contract price for droving in 1926 was two shillings per head per hundred miles. Seemed a long way to drive a bullock for two shillings, but that was the going rate. When the drover delivered them, there would always be shortages for various reasons, lameness, sickness, or perhaps losses at night. But every beast was precious, and no one inquired too closely as to how he managed to keep his killer allowance reasonably intact. No one, that is... Except, perhaps, the cattlemen whose country passed through? Well, they may have had grounds for suspicion, but, as they used to say, an old dog for a hard road. And a hard road it was indeed. Before our cattle were counted over to the drover, there was one last task. They had to be dipped under the supervision of the local mounted policeman, who, in addition to his other numerous duties, was inspector of stock. This job entailed putting them through an evil-looking arsenical brew to kill off whatever ticks they carried. Now we delivered one more mob of bullocks, making 2,500 altogether. Then, after a couple of days' spell, pulled the shoes off our horses, mustered and shod a fresh lot, and set off again to start branding. This was a lot different. This time, when we brought the day's muster together, the cows with clean-skin calves were cut out and yarded, and the branding started the following morning. Nearly all the branding was done in a bronco yard, a holding yard with a bronco panel in one corner. The clean-skin calves were lassoed from a horse, the bronco horse, with a heavy leather breastplate strapped over the saddle to which a green hide rope was buckled. A horseman rides into the mob, the rope coiled over his arm. The rope snakes out, drops round the neck of an unsuspecting calf. The struggling, bellowing youngsters then dragged to the bronco panel, speedily leg rope dropped onto its side, hit with a branding iron by one man, earmarked by another, if a bull castrated by a third, and the whole operation's over in a matter of seconds. Now, the branding went on day after day as we moved from waterhole to waterhole, staying from a week to ten days at each camp. The tally gradually crept up. One thousand, two thousand, three thousand... A few weeks later, I left Lake Nash. There was no particular reason, except that there was so much to see. We had come into the station to get fresh horses for the next muster, and I heard that a drover named Christy Newton, who was camped on the lake, wanted someone to help him take his sixty-odd head of horses to Cloncurry, where he lived between droving. I took the job. A week later, in Cloncurry, I called at one of the pastoral houses and immediately got a job on Strathfield Station. Two days later, I was in the saddle again. Strathfield was in the middle of a devastating drought, and all the breeders were being mustered and moved to another of the company's properties, Glen Ormiston, where they were fortunate enough to have a surplus of feed. Two mobs had already gone, and a drover was waiting for another two, which would be the last. There'd be mostly breeders with young calves, some young males, about 3,000 head altogether, give or take a 100 or so. The drover was Jack Clark a grizzled veteran of many a dry stage, known throughout western Queensland and South Australia. We mustered for another fortnight into a holding paddock of about a hundred square miles. We had something over 3,000 head in hand, but a lot weren't fit to travel. The drover wouldn't accept any he thought wouldn't get there, which, on appearances, was just about all of them. It finally got down to 1,700, and Clark decided to take them as one mob rather than two, a bit unwieldy, but, as he pointed out, they'll soon find out. He wasn't far out there, either. When Clark left, Strathfield would just about be shut down until it rained, and that looked a long way off. 
What was left was mainly bullocks that would probably see the drought out, or breeders that were too weak to travel and certainly wouldn't. In any case, I'd have been out of work. Clark was a couple of men short, so I took a job with him. Anticipating two mobs of cattle, he had more than 80 horses, a wagonette and six pack saddles. I got the job of offsider to the horse tailor, normally a one-man job, but this was two droving plants in one. The cook was Jack Cassidy, not surprisingly known as Hopalong. There was a black, a brown and a white, and everybody got them mixed up. I could identify black because he had black hair. Another man was named Dutchy. I never did hear his right name. Might have been Dutchy. The horse tailor was Percy Norris, who'd been with Jack Clark for years on and off. We left Strathfield Boundary early one morning. The head stockman, Ernie Hamilton, rode over to say goodbye and said he'd probably see me at Glen Ormiston. We headed the cattle for the stock route about a mile from the Strathfield Boundary. It was a mile wide and fenced each side. This was my first experience of droving, though I had a fairly good idea of how it was carried out. There's very little grass, except outside the stock route, and that was jealously guarded by the owners, their stockmen and overseers. Getting a feed for the horses was a continual battle of wits. At night, we would open fences and put them into someone's precious grass. Sometimes we'd take a swag and camp with them, in order to get an early start before we were discovered. There were some bitter hours. Some of the station men had some sympathy with us, but they too had a job to do. Getting beef for the camp was always a worry because there was nothing amongst ours fit to eat. The boss knew the manager of Tulabuck, a sheep station, and he filled our packs with mutton, but that didn't happen very often. Sometimes Providence gave a helping hand and uh, sometimes we helped Providence. One of the laws of droving was that the properties through which the driver passed had to receive notice of his approach 24 hours before he got to the boundary. A stockman would then come along, meet him and see him through the run. The idea, of course, was to keep him honest. If the stock route offence, they didn't always bother an omission for which we were sometimes very grateful. A week after we passed Tulabuck, some cattle walked in for a drink where we were watering. Among them was a young bullock in good condition. It committed suicide before our very eyes, deliberately running into a bullet from Jack Clark's Winchester. The meat wasn't wasted. Some time later, we were well down the Hamilton, Jack and I came across half a dozen cattle under the shade of a gum tree. Jack had a rifle with him and waited about so carelessly that it went off and a fat cow became mortally wounded. Telling the story later to a very few select friends, Jack said, It was so mortally wounded it dropped dead on the spot. This time the situation nearly got serious. Dutchy, black or white, I forget which, and I were butchering it. The boss, sitting on his horse, rolling a smoke, watching us and giving lots of free advice, when suddenly he spotted a couple of horsemen riding towards us. We rightly assumed them to be men from Warrender, the station we were passing through. At that particular time, we didn't need company, especially Warrender company. They were right at the bottom of the list. They'd started to canter their horses and were getting perilously close. I wondered how the hell we were going to get out of this one. Jack said, Tom, whip those ears off. Dutchy, cut that bloody brand out. Quick and lively now. A few quick slashes and it was done. Right out of the boss says, shove it all up his ass. Hurry up. The two men reined their horses, giving the carcass a close inspection before they spoke. They were well mounted. The man on a fine chestnut, clearly in a position of authority, the head stockman, as I learned later. The other on a bay mare had the look of a jackaroo about him, smartly dressed, shiny riding boots, bright jangling spurs. The boss was having trouble with his smoke, and we were waiting to see what was going to happen next. The head stockman knew the boss, as I would have expected. Die, Jack, killing, eh? One of yours? he asked. Course it's one of mine, very indignantly. You don't think I'd be stupid enough to knock one of yours over, do you? He didn't answer, but said, Well, you wouldn't mind if I had a look at the brand in here, Mark, would you? No, says Jack. Go right ahead. It's a bit hacked about, but they'll be there somewhere. The two men got off their horses and pulled the hide away from the carcass. They held it up, they laid it down, they turned it over. The jackaroo got down on his knees. 
Then they looked for the earmark again, without success. They never thought of looking up its arse. When they got back on their horses, I saw the head stockman look across at our poverty-stricken cattle grazing nearby, then down at the well-nourished carcass on the ground. Just as he turned to go, he said, OK, Jack, you win. We left the Hamilton River and crossed over to the Burke, following it down to the Georgina. At last we had got to good feed. The river had run and spread through its numerous channels, and there was an abundance of lush greenery and plenty of water. We had two days spell and turned up the Georgina. We were on Marion Downs country, which adjoined Glen Ormiston, and in another week would reach our destination. The day before we were due to arrive, the boss sent one of the men on to advise the manager. At the boundary gate, we were met by Ernie Hamilton. I remembered him saying that he would see me at Glen Ormiston, but I hadn't given it any more thought. He'd been appointed manager. After the cattle were counted, he came over to me, shook hands, and asked if I'd take a job in the stock camp. This suited me fine, so I went straight on to the Glen Ormiston payroll. The Glen Ormiston camp was a good one. Mick Nulty was the head stockman, there were four white stockmen, including me, four black stockmen, and a cook who had a very good voice and used to entertain us around the campfire at night with old bush thongs. The work was routine, branding was in full swing. A couple of times we attended a boundary muster on the northern boundary that adjoined Roxburgh Downs, a station belonging to the same company as Lake Nash. It was always something we looked forward to, swapping yarn, genuine and otherwise, around the campfire. I had a bad fall. A dirty little chestnut horse threw me in some rough country and I was badly cut about the face. The flies attacked the cuts in swarms. McNulty swabbed them liberally with iodine, which was very savage treatment, and when I got my breath back, I told him so. Not long after, I was unlucky enough to get a bad attack of sandy blight. I went through agony. It felt as though someone was rubbing sand into my eyes with the heel of a boot. They stuck together with a horrible yellow discharge, and I was sure I was going blind. I bathed them continually, but they got worse. After a few days, Hamilton took me to Bully, a hospital. There wasn't much in the way of treatment. It seemed it had to run its course, but gradually I got better. And after a week, took a room at the only hotel, Ma Howard's, giving some not very serious thought about what to do next. I could have gone back to Glen Ormiston, but had itchy feet. After a couple of days, someone asked me if I wanted work. I said yes, which wasn't strictly accurate, but I realised I'd have to get onto someone's payroll fairly soon. A drover was in town looking for men and had dropped word at the pub that he had a thousand bullocks to lift from Chatsworth. I asked where to. Someone else said he thought it was Wodonga. Where the hell was that? I'd never heard of it. The barman yelled through to the billiard room, Harry, where's Wodonga? Some geographical wizard yelled back, Wodonga? Christ, that's halfway to the bloody South Pole. The next day I joined Bill McEwen, my destination, halfway to the bloody South Pole, actually in Victoria. Bill McEwen was one of the best cattlemen I've ridden with. He carried the whip on Dalgonnelly for some years before he took up droving, and anyone who could claim to have been head stockman there was above average. I knew I was going to get on well with him. We had to get stores and supplies, which would take the best part of a day. His camp was 30-odd miles down the river, and Bill had engaged the only truck in town to cart everything back. While he was busy at the store, he asked me to try to pick up a couple of men and, if possible, a cook. I was able to muster a couple of stockmen, but no cooks were around. They weren't very plentiful anywhere. I bought myself a good riding saddle with my remaining few pounds, a pig's ear poly, so called because of the shape of the knee pads. It was very comfortable, made by MacDonald, a well-known Cloncurry saddler. I was sick of riding in the usual run-of-the-mill stock saddle supplied in camps, and even though it took all my money, I didn't regret it. After all, I lived in it for anything up to 15 hours a day, seven days a week. 